making landfall in the north of a half unknown New Zealand, many of the earliest settlers had their first view of swarming Maori canoes as the tall masted ships tacked into this calm upper reach of the Hokianga Harbour. Here, Judge Manning, the Pākehā Māori, held the first Māori land court in the homestead which he built and wrote the famous book about the north called Old New Zealand. As a century went by, the tide of settlement washing southward left stranded a feeling of history amongst the sturdy Kauri timber buildings. Many of them deserted. Such buildings tell mutely through gaping doorways their tales of lonely pioneering in a half-hostile land. There is one man in the north who, in taking these stories down, is compiling in his own way a notable record of these historic birthplaces. Name, Eric Lee Johnson. Occupation, artist. Nationality, New Zealander. Such passport facts are important, for Lee Johnson is uncompromisingly a New Zealand artist. His hand, trained to follow pathetic detail as well as majestic sweep of his native land, is particularly sensitive to these his Northland surroundings. It is a documentary project he has in hand, the making of a record of the past, such things as are told by a period Northland farmhouse to hand on to the future. Judge Manning's is another subject for him. These early shops at Russell in the Bay of Islands gain his detailed attention, but always his art returns to a lonely farmhouse crouched small in a sweep of hills, or to farmhouses dwarfed by storm-tossed trees, trees grown to replace the felled and massive cowrie. The Lee Johnsons themselves live in one of these pioneer homesteads. At Waimamaku, just south of the Hokianga Heads, it is both their home and their workplace, Vivian Lee Johnson sees a new painting near completion. In 1940, her husband gave up a highly successful career as a commercial artist to devote himself to work which meant more to him. This was at first a precarious and little rewarded choice in a young country, but after hardship, sickness and setback, he has won recognition as a leading interpreter of the New Zealand scene. Jenny and Roddy Lee Johnson are keen artists too. They attend Waimamaku School. A pioneer building blending classroom and schoolmaster's residence, it figures in one of their father's drawings. With the children at school, husband and wife set out on a new day's venture, a new day amidst the life and detail of their neighbourhood. As resident artist, Eric is an accepted figure in the local Maori Pākehā farming community, as familiar to all as the grocer or bus driver. First stop, an abandoned church in an overgrown Maori graveyard. The Lee Johnsons have made a particular interest out of discovering and making known curious features of Northland's past. Today their attention is taken by some mysterious headpieces to graves. A strange blend of Florentine and Maori motifs. They were carved in Kauri in the 1890s by some forgotten European craftsmen. Later there'll be a drawing, today a photograph for reference. Research into another facet of Northland bygones has been started. But historian second and artist first, the painter frequently turns his imaginative eye to the living present. A two-year fellowship from the New Zealand Federation of Art Societies has given time for many studies of Maori life. Today's subjects, John and Wehe Mao and their children, are old friends, and the Lee Johnsons frequent visitors to the Mao farm. Preliminary study for a central theme. Soon, the first rough draft of the painting is taking shape. Figures and objects develop and change positions as the artist composes. Second and third drafts give way in this work to a more stylized version. From studio to gallery, Lee Johnson drawings and paintings have been widely exhibited and reproduced in New Zealand and overseas. His signature has become one of the first names amongst the writers and artists whose subject is New Zealand. At Piha near Auckland, the sea boils on a rugged western coast. Silence at Pompelia House, Russell, memorial to colonial beginnings of the Catholic faith. And next, Life on Main Street, Northland version. A lonely church building in a wild, deserted setting. Behind all these works, the man and artist Eric Lee Johnson exploring the past and present of his tranquil Northland.
that others may more fully enjoy and understand the experience of living here, he tells what he has discovered in the language of the artist. Since the war, more than 15,000 Dutch immigrants have come to New Zealand, bringing with them many old customs of their homeland. One of these, dressing the eggs, is an annual Easter ritual. It goes far back into the history of a hard-working people, with not much to spend on luxuries, but a great deal to give in kindliness and talent. Long John Silver joins the other characters. Centuries before chocolate eggs were even thought of, hand-painted eggs symbolized the resurrection. Easter morning arrives. Young Dutch settlers and their newfound friends enjoy a custom of the old world transplanted to the new. New Zealand has recently been enjoying a long predicted epidemic of centennial jollifications. Cabinet was present for the latest outbreak, an Invercargill one celebrating a hundred years of Scots settlement in Southland. For a time this was a separate province but today local government means county council. The Scots were not the first inhabitants down here, not by a long way. With 50 floats, this tale of a hundred summers is a mile and a half long in the telly. Epidemic, did I say? Coming, Doctor. In Southland, the Presbyterian Church has helped preserve Scottish flavour. Soon someone else comes along disputing Scott's priority. It's the irrepressible Irish claiming Kelly of Inverkelly as the first white settler. Cheerful visitors from north and south include His Excellency the Governor-General and Lady Norrie. The Ministry of Works contingent slap on a snappy royal salute. His Excellency sees for himself just how it is the department manages to make the work go round. What a country this would be if every roadman's camp had the luxury of help in the back kitchen. Here come the outriders. Anyone seen three horses? put the horse before the cart on this next one. The horseless carriage with mascot leads a cavalcade of jalopies. Here, down south, the spirit of old Scotland's brewed not in the heather, but in the tea tree scrub. Delivery to whiskey-loving customers seems a bit primitive. The secret still's gone on the wagon, but grog droppers can't resist the chance of a vice-regal patron. His Excellency certainly grasps the spirit of the occasion. The next float, though, provides something mild to break it down with. Still going strong after helping to build the province's prosperity, the old tractors proudly follow the Centennial Road. A reminder of neighbourly gatherings where hot sun shone on golden wheat. The cumbersome old threshing machine brings a last touch of nostalgia to Southland's colourful celebrations of her hundred years of progress. Len and Mick Scott learned fishing from their father, who was seeing them off to work this morning. Each of the brothers has his own boat, and they sail together just before sunrise from a little wharf about 40 miles north of Auckland. The 
road to work, a winding mangrove creek, leads down to a great lagoon known as Kaipara Harbor. At this time of year, sharks are likely to have scared off all smaller fish, so the best way for Kaipara fishermen to make a living is to prepare bait and hooks for sharks. Not very big ones, but wanted by the fish oil industry. The brothers park to test out the fishing on two different banks. Mick's mate puts down a trailer line, a short hand line used to see if any sharks are biting. In a little while, Len comes back. No luck at all where he's been, not even the smell of a shark. So he cruises in close to see if Mick's doing any good. Yes, it looks as though this is the place to fish. Should be a good big liver in that one. Better get the big line out smartly. A man has to be careful landing sharks. They can give a nasty gash with those teeth, as well as getting the line tangled. Len gets his big line out too. It has about 70 large hooks, and the spine is a rope thick enough to take on any size of shark. After about an hour, Mick gets his winch turning. Not far off, Len's having luck too. He's probably into the same school of sharks, and they're certainly taking a beating. All through summer, the brothers will be out on the harbour seeking for sharks, and on lucky days like this, finding them. Up they come, always up, with fins for Chinese soup, flesh for city markets, and livers for vitamin oil. And there are more waiting patiently in the queue. At the end of the day comes the big job of gutting and stripping. The real prize in this business is the liver, almost as long as the fish. Livers are dropped into milk cans for delivery to the vitamin oil factory. By the time three or four hundred sharks have been dealt with, the boats are near home again, headed for tea, fireside, and another day on the Kaipara Harbour tomorrow. Ray's centre rail gripped by puffing fill engines, the one in 15 grade of the Rimataka incline carried 77 years of traffic out of the Wairarapa Plains. In 1880, a train was blown off the rails here by wind funnelling down the rocky valley. Seventy-seven years of this heavy going was a bit too much. A five and a half mile tunnel was planned. After 19 months driving from both ends for 24 hours a day, Time came to prepare the final shot that would mean victory over the Rimataka barrier. She's through. East meets west. And the next big job is the welding and laying of the tracks. From 350 foot welded length, Long sets of track were assembled to be run all complete into the tunnel.
They're 1,600 feet below the hilltops. Outside, the old Bell Railway and its junction at Cross Creek approach their last days. School and picnic parties have come to bid farewell to the puffingest engines ever. Veteran driver Jock Walker makes a final inspection. At Cross Creek, both cleaning and coaling were always heavy work. Bells fairly ate coal, and what they didn't, driver and fireman did. Coal on the footplate, coal on your feet, and brake shoes. Each time she came down meant a new pair worn out and thrown on the scrap heap. There were plenty to see the old fells go, and the new diesels arrive. Into retirement go Jock Walker and other loyal old timers. As for souvenirs, squashed halfpennies were soon to a penny. The Wairarapa wrapper celebrates, for the new line is open to bring its rich farms closer to the export wharves of Wellington Harbour. Leaving behind the Wairarapa Lake, the first new train approaches the bleak, dark hills of the Rimatucka Range. But thanks to the driving of the longest tunnel in the British Commonwealth, these hills are a barrier no longer. <laughs>